Tennessee signed Bud Dupree to a five-year, $82 million contract with about $35 million guaranteed, which made him the 13th highest paid edge rusher in the NFL. I wasn't a fan of the signing at the time, especially considering Carl Lawson, who is a much better player, signed with the Jets for less money, and this move exemplifies one of the few concrete philosophical issues that I have with John Robinson as a general manager, which is that he focuses too much on sack numbers when evaluating pass rushers and not enough on pressures. A pass rusher being able to beat his blocker and pressure the quarterback is reliant pretty much just on the skill level of those two players, but a player being able to turn a pressure into a sack is connected to so many other factors that are outside of that player's control. Pressure numbers have shown to be much more stable year to year and much better indicators of whether or not a pass rusher is consistently beating offensive linemen. Sack numbers, on the other hand, fluctuate pretty significantly year to year, and we see all the time players will stumble into a 10-sack season, get a huge contract, and then never reach that level of production again. And you might have noticed that I never really talk about sack numbers in my videos because it's just not a stat that I find that important or even one that I really pay attention to at all. If I had the choice between Carl Lawson, who over the last two seasons has 11 sacks and a pressure rate of 14%, and Bud Dupree, who's had 22 sacks but a pressure rate of 10.4%, I'm taking Carl Lawson and assuming that the sack numbers will balance themselves out over time. With all that being said, we're going to take a look at Bud Dupree as a player independent of other guys who are available in free agency and see what he brings to Tennessee's defense that's in desperate need of pass rushing help. So with most NFL contracts, the big number that Adam Schefter tweets out doesn't really mean anything unless you know how the contract is structured and how the guarantees work out. Bud Dupree's contract has a potential out after the 2022 season where he can be cut with only $9 million in dead cap. So if he ends up being terrible, it's not going to be a contract that you can't get rid of or anything. I actually think Bud Dupree has a chance to be good, but I would be surprised if he ends up being worth $20 million a year. 90% of the time that you sign a free agent, you're going to be overpaying, especially with edge rushers, and when you're in a window with a bunch of core players in their prime, it makes perfect sense to be aggressive in free agency and really maximize that window. The good news with Bud Dupree is that he won't have to do much to be an upgrade to what Tennessee had opposite of Harold Landry last year. Outside of Derek Roberson, who's still signed to Tennessee, I'd be surprised if any of the edge defenders that Tennessee ended the year with will make an NFL roster. Dupree and Landry will at the minimum give Tennessee's defense two starting caliber edge rushers. Neither of them are true number ones, but they're both solid number twos with an outside chance of some further development. Statistically, Landry and Dupree are pretty similar caliber players. Landry's a little better as a run defender and Dupree's a little better as a pass rusher. As an athlete, Bud Dupree has a pretty uncommon blend of high-end and low-end traits. His arms are extremely short, which as I've talked about many times, isn't ideal for a pass rusher. But his elite explosiveness translates into a quick first step and powerful hand pop, which prevents his lack of length from holding him back too much. The first place this explosiveness shows up is in pass rushing, where having a fast initial step can help you gain a positional advantage over the tackle if you can get to your spot before he gets into his pass set. There are three main types of pass sets that offensive linemen use depending on the situation. A jump set is a single kick set where the goal is to make contact with the defender as early as possible. Jump sets are mainly used on play action and three step drops where the quarterback's getting rid of the ball quickly and they're best used when the defender is lined up close to the offensive lineman. The second type of pass set is the vertical set where instead of immediately engaging, the tackle drops back at a 90 degree angle to the line of scrimmage and tries to widen the angle that the edge rusher has to take. The third type of set is the 45 degree set, which is sort of the middle ground between the other two. This is sometimes called a lateral set because the lineman is moving laterally at a 45 degree angle. The play call and the alignment of the defender can dictate what pass set an offensive lineman uses, but they're also accounting for the strengths and weaknesses of themselves and their blocking assignment. A tackle who's matched up against a pure speed rusher like Yannick Ngakwe is mainly going to be worried about losing the edge, so they'll probably use more vertical sets, but against someone like Zadarius Smith who has a lot of power but is a bit of a slow starter, they'd probably use more lateral sets and jump sets to protect their inside. 
This is why versatility is such an important but underrated aspect of being a good edge rusher in the NFL. A lot of speed rushers that were able to just run around slower offensive tackles at the college level are much less effective in the NFL because tackles can just vertical set them to death. But Bud Dupree's explosiveness gives him a legitimate blend of power and speed, which means tackles can't just cheat in one direction. On this play, Dupree is lined up as a wide nine, and left tackle Jedrick Wills uses a 45 degree set. The width of Bud Dupree's alignment means it's unlikely Wills would be using a jump set, which would put him off balance and vulnerable to the inside. The 45 degree set involves two kicks or four steps at a 45 degree angle, and ideally the tackle would fully get into his set before engaging the pass rusher. Dupree's able to get upfield quickly enough though that Wills has to widen his angle in the second half of his set, so at the time Dupree makes contact, Wills is off balance and surrenders the edge. Right here, Cam Robinson's going to use a vertical set, which starts with a step directly backwards, and he's basically trying to carry a speed rush downfield and prevent Dupree from flattening and getting to the quarterback. Vertical sets create a deeper pocket, which protects against speed rushers, but they also make the pocket more narrow, so it can be easier to collapse the pocket with a power rush. On this play, Dupree wins with power instead of speed, but his explosiveness is still what helps him generate that power. Cam Robinson's footwork here is pretty clean, he has the length advantage to make first contact and his feet are square with Dupree when he does this, but Dupree's first step and hand pop are explosive enough to still win the rep. His ability to win as a pass rusher in every possible way is the main source of any optimism I have for him. If you're only threatening in one aspect of your game, NFL players will usually be able to shut you down, and I think this is a big reason Harold Landry hasn't been able to take the next step as a pass rusher. If you go back and watch the Cleveland game for example, Jedrick Wills just used vertical sets all game, and Landry couldn't do anything because he hasn't developed the ability to convert speed to power. Even though Bud Dupree has flaws as a pass rusher, which we'll discuss later, he's at least able to attack in multiple ways so tackles can't just be on autopilot all game. Dupree's explosiveness is also valuable in run defense, whether he's the force player setting the edge or a backside defender getting into the backfield, and you again see how this explosiveness can manifest itself as speed or power. Taking a look at Pittsburgh's Week 7 matchup against Tennessee, the Titans are in 12 personnel running a concept called Counter Trey to the left side. Counter Trey gets its name from the tight end tackle combo on the front side which is called a Trey block, and Counter means that the running back takes an initial false step to freeze the defense. In Counter Trey, the backside guard pulls to the Sam linebacker which is Bud Dupree, and the H-back pulls and acts as a lead blocker. There's a lot of moving pieces here as it is, but Tennessee also sends AJ Brown on a jet motion to add even more window dressing to the play. This play is attacking Bud Dupree's gap, and if he were to get sealed off, there's a good chance Henry would have a big play. The purpose of the jet motion here is to widen Bud Dupree out so that when Nate Davis gets there, he can make a bigger gap, but Dupree just explodes back into the play and flattens him as he's pulling. As a force defender, it's important to have a strong anchor and good length, and Bud Dupree doesn't really have either of those, but if you've picked up on the theme here, he makes up for it with other traits. Anchor is important when setting the edge because you need to be able to hold your ground and funnel the ball carrier back inside. Dupree does occasionally get moved off of his spot, but he has the acceleration to regain the ground that he lost when it's time to make the tackle. Length is important because it gives you more control and makes it easier to keep outside leverage. And even though Dupree doesn't have the length, he's so accurate and violent when he engages that a lot of times he's able to stop the blocker's momentum. Jedrick Wills was asked whether it was harder to block TJ Watt or Cameron Hayward, and he responded that sealing off Bud Dupree on the edge was the most difficult thing he attempted as a rookie. Dupree led all edge defenders in points saved per play when an offensive lineman pulled in his direction. He's also great at disrupting run plays from the backside because he recognizes the direction of the play and he has the acceleration to reach the ball carrier early. Sometimes this is as simple as recognizing that he's on the weak side of the play and gambling that the run is going towards the strong side, but other times he's able to read the direction of the play from the offensive lineman's split. 
On this play, Ravens left guard Bradley Bozeman is lined up really close to the center, which is a pretty good indicator that he's pulling to the right side since he'll need to get over there as quickly as possible. Combining that key with the motion to the left and the left tackle leaning towards the right pre-snap, it's pretty clear what direction the run is going, and Dupree wastes no time getting into the backfield to make a stop. When he's correct, he's able to make splash plays like this pretty often, and he was third in the NFL in points saved per play on runs to the opposite direction. But you can tell that offensive coordinators recognize this aggressiveness because they began to take advantage of it on end arounds and misdirections. All they needed to do was put a tight end on the right side and flip it to a receiver going the opposite direction because they knew Bud Dupree would bite on the fake handoff and surrender the edge. This all combines to make Bud Dupree an inconsistent run defender, similar in a lot of ways to Rashawn Evans, who makes a lot of splash plays but is inconsistent on a snap to snap basis. But the reason that Bud Dupree got such a big contract is because of his ability as a pass rusher, and I've already talked about how he's a good fit stylistically for today's NFL, but I want to go over some of the technical ways that he wins and loses. One of the central battles of most speed rushers involves defeating the outside arm, because as a pass rusher, that's the main thing that stands between you and the quarterback, and when you have a length disadvantage, it can be difficult to win on that front. This play against Philadelphia is what Bud Dupree is trying to do pretty much every time he does a speed rush. He splits the tackle in half with the inside hand, clubs the outside hand, and then bends to the quarterback. But he isn't able to cleanly win in all three phases like this very often. A lot of times he doesn't have the length to make first contact with his inside arm, or he can't really give an effective club with his outside arm. He's most successful at his speed rush when he's able to integrate variations and combo moves into his attack plan. The first variation is to start out with a bull rush to sort of contract the tackle's wingspan and make the outside arm easier to get around. This is an effective combo because when the tackle's trying to stop the bull rush, he's going to bring his hands inside more and that gives Dupree easier access. He also has a really nice rip move that starts off like a normal speed rush, but takes advantage of tackles landing their punches too high. Bud Dupree has really good bend, so when the tackle gives him this opening to flatten and get to the quarterback, he's able to take advantage of that pretty consistently. Again, the best thing Bud Dupree has going for him is his versatility, because not only is he able to use a bunch of different moves, but he's able to add power elements to speed rushes and finesse elements to power rushes. Ultimately, I don't love this signing from a value perspective, but I think he definitely makes Tennessee's defense better. While it's true that a lot of his production came off of unblocked pressures and cleanup sacks, there's plenty of examples of him winning as a pass rusher in the traditional sense. Pittsburgh's defense was notably worse once Bud Dupree got injured, and even though he's not a number one pass rusher, him and Landry can make a solid tandem, especially if Jeffrey Simmons takes a step forward. I think the key with Bud Dupree will be managing expectations, especially since he's coming off a torn ACL, and recognizing that you're not getting Khalil Mack, but you're still getting a player that can add a lot of value to your defense. If you like my videos, consider subscribing and also follow me on Twitter and I'll put the link on the screen.